Welcome to another tutorial video. We are going to go over real estate investment trust or REIT valuation and give you a quick crash course in this lesson. This is based on a question that came in the other day, which is help. I have to value a real estate investment trust as part of a case study in an interview. How should I do it? I looked online, but all the templates and examples seem too complicated. So the short answer to this question is that REIT valuation can indeed get complex, but you can simplify things a bit, take an 80-20 approach and get decent results without investing a huge amount of time in it. The first point is that you have to understand how REITs work and their basic characteristics before valuing them. The second point is that you need to know whether a REIT follows US GAAP or IFRS in terms of its accounting. There are a lot of online articles about REITs, but most of them seem to ignore this point and pretend as if the rest of the world outside the US does not exist, but there are accounting and valuation differences that you have to factor in. And then the third point is that REIT valuation is not really that much different. You can still use public comps, precedent transactions, and even a DCF analysis. There are some differences and tweaks and additions, but you can use a lot of the traditional metrics and multiples to value REITs as well. In this lesson, we're going to cover four main points. First, I'm going to tell you about the basic characteristics of REITs and how accounting differs under US GAAP versus IFRS. Then in part two, I will show you very quickly how to build a simple projection model for a REIT and how you can think about at a basic level what a REIT's revenue, expenses, and cash flow might look like going forward. Then I'll explain how to extend it into a discounted cash flow analysis or a dividend discount model. These both apply to normal companies and they can also both apply to REITs. And then in part four, I'll explain how to add a net asset value model, which as you'll see is mostly relevant for US-based REITs. And I will show you an example of public comps for both types of REITs as well. We're covering several hours worth of course material here, and I'm gonna to try to get through it in about 20 minutes. So we'll see how it goes, but we are condensing a lot of material here into a short amount of time. Let's go to point one first and talk about the basic characteristics of REITs. A real estate investment trust is just a company that buys, sells, develops, and operates properties or other real estate assets. To qualify as a REIT, it has to distribute a high percentage of net income in the form of dividends. In the US, it's 90%. In other countries, the percentage varies a bit, but it's always pretty high. And they have to maintain a certain percent of revenue in the form of real estate related revenue, and a certain percent of assets must also be related to real estate. Now, if the REIT complies with all that, then it will pay nothing or very little in corporate income taxes. In the US, REITs actually pay nothing, but in some European countries and Asian countries and elsewhere, the rules differ a little bit. What this means is that REITs are always maintaining, acquiring, developing, renovating, and selling properties. So when you project them and you value them, you have to think about each of those activities. The second point is that REITs constantly need to raise debt and equity because they're distributing so much of their net income in the form of dividends. So they can't really save up much cash over time. So to fund their operations, they're always fundraising. The third implication is that buying, selling, and revaluing properties tends to make net income fluctuate because REITs will record a lot of gains and losses, which means that you have to look at metrics beyond net income. One of the most important alternative metrics is funds from operations or FFO, which is defined as net income plus real estate related depreciation and amortization plus losses minus gains. So you to completely take them out altogether, both realized and unrealized losses and gains, and then you also add back impairments. Now, under US GAAP, REITs depreciate their properties. And so the depreciation expense on the income statement is massive. It's almost always one of the biggest expenses there, if not the biggest expense on the income statement. Under IFRS, REITs do not depreciate their properties, but they do mark them to market value, and they will record fair value gains and losses on their income statements instead. So you can calculate FFO in the same way for both US and international REITs, but the difference is that the depreciation and amortization component of FFO will be zero for IFRS-based REITs, and the losses and gains will be much bigger. Here's a quick example of how the calculation differs for Avalon Bay, a US-based REIT, versus Westfield, an Australian retail REIT. For Avalon Bay, we still start with net income, we add back the depreciation on real estate assets, and then we make some other adjustments. These gains and losses are realized gains and losses. So gains and losses on properties they've actually sold. By contrast with Westfield, we start with profit after tax, basically net income. We make some adjustments for mark to market items, but then the major adjustment here is not depreciation because it doesn't exist for properties for IFRS based REITs, but instead property revaluations. This REIT is constantly revaluing their property portfolio it's recording those changes on the income statement, 
and we add it back to calculate FFO. Now there are some other metrics as well, such as adjusted funds from operations, which starts with FFO and then subtracts recurring maintenance capex and then makes some adjustments for leases and the straight lining of rent and other items. But really the most important one is FFO or variance such as EPRA earnings for European REITs, for example. On the balance sheet, real estate assets, debt, and equity are huge and are the most significant items for all REITs. But under IFRS, the real estate assets are marked to market value. What that means under implication number four here is that assets minus liabilities or book value is important and useful for IFRS based REITs, but you have to adjust it for US based REITs. The typical adjustment is that you will apply a cap rate or yield, the reciprocal of a valuation multiple to the REIT's property income to value its properties. Then you'll estimate the fair market value of its other assets and liabilities, and then you'll subtract liabilities from assets. So you have to go through this manual process of revaluing a REIT's balance sheet if it is following the rules under US GAAP. That's it for point number one. So let's go to point number two now and talk about a simple projection model for a real estate investment trust. I'm gonna show you as an example here, a simplified model that we have for park hotels and resorts, which is a spun off hotel REIT operating in the US. The first step in any projection model for a REIT is to look at its revenue and expenses on its existing or same store properties and assume rental growth and margins on those. Now, this is a hotel REIT, so it's a little bit different, but the idea is similar. We assume a room count, which stays the same here because these are existing properties that don't change at all. We have an occupancy rate. We have an average daily rate. So on average, how much each guest is paying to stay at the hotels across the entire portfolio. And we assume some type of growth on them. And then we assume margins on the room revenue and also the food and beverage revenue and other sources. And we use all those to arrive at the room revenue, food and beverage revenue and other revenue. And we have expenses at the property level associated with those as well. If we were looking at an office REIT or an apartment REIT, the method would be slightly different. We look at the rent per square foot or per unit or per square meter or something like that instead. But it's still the same idea when we start with the existing properties of the REIT. The next step is to make assumptions for the REIT's acquisition, development, and renovation plans. For example, you might assume something for the annual spending and then a yield on that spending and a margin on that spending. For our example here, we've assumed about 250 million to 300 million in acquisitions per year. We've assumed yields of between 6.1% and 6.5% on it. And we've assumed an NOI margin, NOI net operating income being similar to EBITDA of 30%. And we use that to arrive at the revenue for these acquired hotels and also the expenses for these acquired hotels based on the spending. We do something very similar for development and redevelopment, except the yield is higher because these are more opportunistic and we're only gonna develop and redevelop properties in areas where it's really going to pay off. Then in step three, you can assume that the REIT also divests properties, it records gains and losses, and then it loses revenue and operating income as a result. Here, we're assuming that they divest around 150 million worth of hotels each year. They lose between 15 and 20% on each sale. So that also means that the real estate assets on the balance sheet are gonna go down, which we've projected. It also means that the NOI is going to go down each year and the revenue is also going to decrease each year. Then in step four, we can add up all the property level revenue and expenses. And you can see that up here at the top, we've aggregated everything. And in some cases for the same store properties, the revenue is additive, the expenses keep going up each year, and the same for acquisitions, developments, and redevelopments. Revenue and expenses keep going up. With the dispositions, our revenue goes down and our expenses become more positive. In other words, less negative, and that's the direct result of disposing of these properties. Then in step five, you move over to the corporate level and you project items like depreciation, SG&A, maintenance capex, and working capital in the traditional way that you might expect for even a normal company. So for example, on this company's income statement, we have depreciation and amortization. We don't do anything complicated here. We just make it a simple percent of revenue. REITs have so many properties that it's often cumbersome to actually set up a whole separate schedule for this one. Corporate and other expenses are also a percent of revenue. And many of these working capital items like AR, accounts payable, and so on are percentages of revenue or expenses. Maintenance capex falls into the same category. There are so many properties here that it's not really viable to project this one 
based on a detailed schedule of dozens or hundreds of hotels. Then in step six, since REITs have to issue dividends, you often make dividends a percent of FFO, AFFO, or a similar metric. You could even make them a percent of net income if you wanted to. Down here, we've assumed that they're 65% of FFO each year. And based on that, we can calculate our planned dividends. Then in step seven, you assume that the REIT issues debt or equity based on the cash balance before this financing takes place versus a minimum cash balance, which you often project as a small percent of the REIT's expenses. So here, for example, we look at the REIT's total operating expenses. We multiply by the 5% minimum cash balance right here. And we use that to figure out the minimum cash level that the REIT must maintain. Now, the cash balance before debt and equity financing, we calculate by taking most of what's on the cash flow statement. We've linked in many of these items like the acquisitions, developments, and dispositions from our segment by segment buildup. Cash flow from operations comes mostly from our income statement. We add back non-cash items like depreciation and amortization. So we take most of what's on the cash flow statement and we say, let's pretend that we now issue these dividends. If we issue dividends in this amount, what does our cash balance look like? And initially here, we're okay for the first year, but then very quickly in the second year, we get into a case where we are below the minimum cash balance. And so we need to raise some amount of debt and equity. And the same thing keeps happening in the future years. We assume a 50-50 split between debt issued and equity issued here. And so the debt and equity balances keep going up each year. Now that's gonna make a direct impact on us because it means that the company's share count is going to increase. It also means that their net interest expense is going to increase or at least change each year as the debt balance keeps increasing. So that is the basic idea of how you project the three statements for REITs. Let's now go into part three and talk about how you might extend this into a DCF or dividend discount model. Now, as always in the DCF, if you have a three statement model for the company already, you wanna start by linking in the revenue and expenses and other items from your projection model to calculate unlevered free cash flow. With this example for park hotels, we do just that. We start with our revenue, which we've linked in from the operating model. We subtract our operating expenses to get to our operating income. And then we adjust for non-cash items like depreciation and amortization. We adjust for working capital. And then we adjust for capital expenditures and asset sales. Now, unlike with a normal company where you normally just have maybe one or two CapEx line items, here you have to factor in maintenance CapEx, acquisitions, developments and redevelopments. And you also have to account for the fact that REITs generally keep disposing of properties year after year. So dispositions are not a non-recurring item for a REIT. They're actually a recurring and important item that takes place each year. You can ignore corporate taxes in most cases, or for non-US based REITs, you might factor in a small amount of corporate taxes, but you do have to include all this CapEx spending and all the asset disposals. Also, you have to track the stock issued by the REIT which I've shown down here and made a percent of CapEx spending going forward. Since REITs keep issuing equity and debt each year, this is going to make an impact because it means that in the future, they're gonna have a higher share count. We can estimate the value of that higher share count in the future and add it to the REIT's current share count to account for the fact that they're diluting investors and will create more shares in the future. This is something you rarely see with a DCF for normal companies, but you do have to factor it in here. Then you can project revenue growth, margins, DNA, CapEx, and asset sales beyond the end of the projection period to get about 10 years total of projections. And you can see my assumptions over here. Overall, they're fairly simple growth rates for revenue. Expenses are a pretty simple percent of revenue. And then everything else is also generally a simple percentage of revenue. And we just assume these numbers stabilize in the future over a 10 year period. You also have to make some type of simple assumption for stock issuances. As I said, in this model, I've just made it a percent of total capital costs, roughly equal to the company's net CapEx spending. And we estimate how much stock they're gonna need in the future based on that. To calculate terminal value in a DCF like this, you can use a terminal multiple, enterprise value to EBITDA, or you can look at the long-term GDP growth and use the Gordon growth method. But the terminal value setup is pretty much exactly the same. And we back into implied equity value at the bottom. When we get to the implied share price, the only difference is that we have to divide by total shares outstanding, including the impact of those future shares to be issued. If you want to create a dividend discount model instead, I'll bring up here this example of a European REIT, Colonial, which is based in France and Spain. 
The setup overall is quite similar, but there are some differences. For one thing, you use cost of equity instead of WAC because dividends are an equity value based metric. So the calculations are a bit different. You still have to track stock issuances. You still link in revenue and expenses and all those in the same way. You can make dividends still a percent of FFO or EPR earnings or some other adjusted metric like that. And terminal value is also similar, except you're gonna use an equity value based multiple instead, or you could still use the Gordon growth method to calculate it. And then of course, at the end, you get the equity value directly. So you don't have to back into anything here. When you get the implied share price, you still need to take this implied equity value and divide by the adjusted share count, factoring in those future share issuances. Overall, we still prefer the unlevered DCF because it's easier to set up. You don't have to forecast interest or debt or many of the items like that, but you can certainly create a dividend discount model if you want. Let's now go into part four and talk about the net asset value or NAV model and public comps for REITs. For IFRS based REITs, the property values are already appropriate because they're constantly revaluing their portfolios. So book value is pretty close to NAV. And so you don't really have to create a net asset value model for these REITs. In our projections for Colonial, in each segment, we revalue the assets based on an assumed gross yield. So when we list these assets on the balance sheet, they're already shown at fair market value in each year based on our projections. By contrast, if you're working with a US based REIT, the first step is to project the property income called the net operating income over the next 12 months, divide it by an assumed cap rate, which is the reciprocal of a valuation multiple. So a lower cap rate means a higher multiple, a higher cap rate means a lower multiple. You use that to get the market value of the real estate assets. And then you adjust everything else, the construction progress, cash, AR, other assets tend to stay the same, and you take goodwill and other intangibles to zero in most cases. Then you have to adjust the liabilities. The main adjustment here is for the debt. If the interest rates or credit risk have changed, you need to adjust this to fair market value. So that's usually the biggest thing on this side. And then you usually keep the others about the same unless you have a very specific reason to change them. To calculate net asset value, you take market value of assets, the market value of all liabilities and subtract. And then you can calculate net asset value per share by dividing by the shares outstanding. Then you can compare this to the company's current share price and you can see whether the company is appropriately valued, undervalued or overvalued at the moment. With the public comps, typically you will screen based on the total amount of real estate assets the company has. So here we're looking at a screen based on US based hotel REITs with gross real estate assets above 3 billion. The geography and sub industry and financial metrics are still important, but they're slightly different for REITs. You can still calculate equity value, enterprise value, EBITDA, enterprise value to EBITDA. And we have all those here. We have EBITDA, equity value, enterprise value, and we even have enterprise value to EBITDA for the historical and projected numbers down here. The difference is that for US based REITs, you're going to look at some alternative metrics as well, such as FFO and price to FFO. In other words, equity value divided by FFO. You may also look at net asset value and price to net asset value per share. So here we have our FFO projections as well. We look at the growth rates for our financial metrics, and then we look at equity value divided by FFO as another multiple down here. For IFRS based REITs, you will tend to use book value and price to book value instead of net asset value and price to net asset value. So for Colonial, for example, we still have EBITDA, we still have equity value and enterprise value, but the difference is that now we look at historical book value as a metric and we look at price to book value because this is a very close proxy for net asset value for these types of REITs. One question we get is how to find the data. The easiest option is to use Google Finance, look up related companies and pull in the basics from there. You could go and look up Park Hotels, click on related companies and get a lot of these numbers and companies from there. For the projected numbers, you can just use simple percent growth rates for EBITDA, FFO, and so on. Really, the most important part is to get the market cap, the historical numbers, and the beta for these companies so you can calculate the discount rate for use in a DCF or dividend discount model. And you can get projections for the growth rates for EPS, revenue, and other items from Yahoo Finance. They normally provide them for free, and then you can just apply them to EBITDA, FFO, and other metrics. So we've been through a lot here at a very quick speed. Let's do a quick recap and summary. REITs are companies that own, operate, sell, acquire, develop, and redevelop real estate. They have to issue a significant percentage of their net income, almost 100% in most cases, in the form of dividends, 
and then comply with other requirements related to revenue and assets related to real estate. If they do that, they can avoid paying corporate income taxes or pay very little in corporate income taxes. The basic differences under US GAAP versus IFRS are that under US GAAP, there's a huge depreciation expense because REITs depreciate their properties. Under IFRS, that doesn't happen. Instead, they revalue their properties. And so the revaluation adjustment on the income statement is huge. To build a simple projection model for a REIT, you have to look at each segment separately. Same store, existing properties. Then you make assumptions for the acquisitions, developments and redevelopments, and you assume something for the sales or dispositions of properties. Once you have all those set up, you aggregate the revenue and expenses. Then you project the corporate level items to get the full three statement model for them. And you carry that going forward. You set dividends equal to a percent of FFO or AFFO in most cases. And then you assume debt and equity financing based on the REITs cash balance before any financing takes place relative to what it needs to maintain at all times. You can extend it into a dividend discount model or discounted cash flow analysis fairly easily. You just extend the projections, link in what you have to calculate unlevered free cash flow, for example. Terminal value is still calculated in the same way, but you have to be careful to factor in the additional shares issued in the future if the REIT keeps issuing stock going well into the future. And then the net asset value model is important and relevant for US based REITs. You apply a cap rate to the forward net operating income, you revalue the other assets and liabilities, subtract liabilities from assets, and then you can calculate net asset value and net asset value per share and compare it to the REIT's current share price. For public comps, you screen based on real estate assets, geography, and sub industry. And you can look at traditional metrics like EBITDA, enterprise value to EBITDA, and so on, but you can also look at FFO and price to FFO or AFFO if you want. And for IFRS based REITs, you can also look at book value and price to book value. That's it for our quick crash course. Hopefully you now know more about real estate investment trusts and how to value them.